My fellow Americans and viewers throughout the world watching the 2016 U.S. elections, if you elect me President of the United States in 2016, I will be an international leader. My family isn't from Kenya or Hawaii, but that gives me more focus. I was born in New Mexico as my father served in the Air Force. I was a linguist in the Air Force and a serious student of Vietnamese language. I have also studied and still work with more than a dozen languages. I read the newspapers in multiple languages and am able to use other languages to gain the information that the U.S. mainstream media ignores. Now I see the Democrat voters, according to national polls, rank national security and terrorism behind job creation, economic growth, health care, and climate change. I have workable and beneficial policies on each one of these. I have developed them during my Senate campaign against Al Franken and my U.S. House campaigns against Betty McCollum. But I say to you today that none of these areas can be addressed in a vacuum. America is great, but America is part of a family of nations. Sometimes that is a dysfunctional family. But we need to expand it. We need to integrate it. And we need to order our relations throughout the globe and, yes, be stewards and care for the planet. That is a religious belief, but it's also a common sense. I want to give a broad foreign policy speech, but I don't want you to think I'm rambling or that I'm just giving ideas. Foreign policy can be understood with common sense. Special credentials are not needed. And one candidate's common sense may be more persuasive than another's. But these policies can and must be put to work, not merely theorized. And that is why we must listen to other nations and as we do, we need to understand who we are and what we have to offer. And we have a lot. And we will gain a lot as we listen to and find grounds to coexist with all other nations. I am adamant that the United States and our heritage be restored and preserved. And I think that heritage includes American exceptionalism and could be summed up as American democratic leadership. I don't mean the Democrat Party a national party that seeks to dominate America nationwide and infringe on our freedom at home. We are still perfecting our democracy. The Democrats have stumbled in the area of foreign policy. Hillary Clinton's foreign policy is really to export undemocratic practices that she can't get to work in other countries. She pretends to lift the status of women all over the world, and she thinks that is the key to solving all the world's problems. Well, obviously, it is not. Only those who live in a cocoon can believe that her formula is working. On the contrary, we need everybody. We need the brave and good men who first secured liberty on this continent when they brought forth a new nation with loving family values and courageous initiative and tenacity, values which are really at the heart of our best sports, which we also celebrate universally through the Olympics. We need all of that heart to be put back into restoring this nation. We need red, brown, and yellow races. We need black, tan, and white races. Republican candidates are weighing in on foreign policy, but I don't think they're providing strong enough world leadership. It's not enough just to defend civil rights of Americans while shifting military to autopilot with drones. We wandered into uncharted territory when George H.W. Bush in 1990 committed us to long-term military presence in the Middle East after Hussein invaded Kuwait. We know the oil is there, although many other nations, including the U.S. and Canada, have a lot of oil. And although we can shift from reliance on petroleum-based energy, and we must just as fast as we can interest Americans and others in purchasing workable sources of energy for our life needs, as well as for manufacturing. The environment is very important, but we also must make progress in energy. But this is not just about oil. With Bush, we, with Bush 1, we did step into this territory. And we've learned that Bush 1, James Baker, and even British Prime Minister John Majors had extensive involvement in Saudi Arabia, where the 9-11 attack came from, and with the Bin Laden family through the Carlyle Group. And then, a decade after the Iraq invasion, in 1993, uh, in a first attempt on the uh, World Trade Center in New York, 
and after that came a second successful attack by our enemies on 9-11. And after that, America needed to respond, and a lot of planning and intelligence, apparently faulty, was public and involved the question of weapons of mass destruction. But that was not the only question, or most important question. The most important question was, and still is, what was behind that 9-11 attack? And were there grounds to justify military action against Iraq? A lot of young people who have never been involved in defending the nation, as my generation was uh, more broadly during the Vietnam conflict, have concluded that media reports about faulty intelligence from Colin Powell call into question the need to have been involved uh, in military action there. But also before 2001, just over a decade ago, Americans would have been shocked to think that a foreign enemy could carry out such a devastating attack on the World Trade Center. And that called for defending our nation. I don't agree with George W. Bush's response. He drafted men from the National Guard. He used the Air Force and began to mechanize the war with no apparent plan. After taking over Baghdad, we were surrounded and our National Guard members were pinned down. And without a surge fought for by John McCain, a senator with POW and extensive combat experience, we couldn't even hold the country. And we stayed in that posture for a long time. But then I don't agree that our invasion of Iraq after 9-11 was primarily based on incorrect intelligence about Iraq's weapons capability. That is the kind of national security reasoning that some reporter, in this case Karen Tumulty of the Washington Post, finds in a database somewhere, as the conventional wisdom of the mainstream media about past conflicts that might figure into the 2016 campaign. It's not the experience of a man or woman who has been deployed to the conflict or who has a family member or friend who has sacrificed their life or their mobility or psychological well-being or even their economic future in our competitive economy to that military campaign. It was not based on that, Colin Powell's idea that there were the makings of nuclear weapons in Iraq. And the military response was essential because we were attacked by the Taliban. And as we all now see, as Muslim immigrants are all around the country and following their faith and way of life and some of the problems with violent extremism, the Taliban are just a part of a huge clash of Islamic powers throughout the Middle East and Africa and Asia who were seeking, for whatever reason, to promote themselves or at least maintain a strong leadership position in addition to the self-determination to maintain their Afghan way of life. And really what they did was give space for the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood and the Saudi Wahhabis. Now, with Obama, we've pulled out of all of that. Obama's a Muslim culturally, although apparently he claims he does not try to follow the Quran. It's not clear. But in reality, when we were attacked by bin Laden, who Obama uh, says he's a hero because bin Laden was apparently killed in a raid, uh, we were attacked by this huge uh, wash of Muslim powers from throughout the Middle East and the globe, as I've said. Now notice that I want to defend America's interests, but I don't think Obama or Hillary Clinton, as our Secretary of State under Obama, served Americans' interests. And a big part of this presidential campaign has to be to redefine our interests and restore our interests. What it should not be is to impose the so-called American values of elites on every other country in the world. We are, in my opinion, destroying our way of life as new social media elites seek to impose a kind of new history on us, including violence in the streets, enforcing homosexual ideas on the populace. When we try to impose this as a so-called foreign policy with political, uh, should we say, creatures like uh, Hillary and Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, that is self-destruction. We do not want a self-destructive foreign policy. We must learn from our mistakes. We must, must forge a strong and compelling vision of the U.S. role in the world, and we should involve all Americans in leading the family of nations according to our vision and commitment and skill as well as our military capabilities. Our military capabilities should not be there to win a confrontation like Armageddon. 
They should be there to advance our roles as leaders of freedom secured by written constitutions with the basic human rights spelled out in our own constitution. What kind of weapons and what kind of leadership do we need for that? Drones, targeted bombings, listening devices, nuclear weapons and defenses against nuclear missiles? Are these the type of weapons we can rely on to keep the world safe and keep hope alive that a world full of freedom has a future? While I insist and will insist that we are well equipped militarily to meet any challenge, all that these weapons give to us is time, and we need to use that time. That time is for us to create a nation full of true freedom as man is capable with the inspiration of God to create and to attain. If we cannot do this, we are hollow. A world full of bank loans and material consumption is a hollow world that cannot survive in a world of automatons and expensive technological weaponry. This is why our own privacy with a, a highly centralized and highly ideological central government is increasingly at risk. Yes, we must secure our borders as an element of self-defense, but not because immigrants do not help us or even because they speak a language other than English, but because our concept of freedom is based on secured rights. And this includes the right secured in our constitution to defend our borders. And the only way we can logically defend our borders consistent with our values is through extensive economic development throughout the international border zone. So it will attract and retain people on both sides of the border in an integrated economy to build America up as an economic powerhouse based on democracy and freedom. Nor should we abuse our soldiers as Obama rents them out to African presidents as stand-ins for an effective war on Ebola and other deadly plagues that are out there. As George Bush helped to lead on AIDS, which helps America, because diseases know no boundaries and quarantines are only partially effective, we need to get serious with our health professionals. And yet, as the Ebola crisis arose, health professionals did not want help. While some did, there was not sufficient infrastructure to support actions to isolate victims and prevent a broader uh, contagious outbreak. And basically, that's all we did there. Pharmaceuticals were unprepared because it's not profitable. And so we need to use America's universities and healthcare leadership to defend ourselves, not only against AIDS, but other biological threats. That is a foreign policy issue. I have had the privilege of visiting and reporting on work of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences, and there are international resources we must urgently develop right now. We need to work with all nations in all environments and with great knowledge and foresight to prevent the spread of these threats across our border. Of course, the greatest plague is war and insurrection, and Obama has failed on this, and our defenses are at great risk. And this is not a feather in Obama's cap so he can control the nation's civil defense and police force to advance his own goals. It is a threat to national security. It is not only that Obama has done a poor job in the areas of foreign policy and national defense. It is that he is a positive risk, and Hillary Clinton is a positive risk. We need to restore our values. If Clinton is cynically joining this new history to wipe out the strength of America, then America has got to fight back in the 2016 presidential race. I will do that. I will restore the moderate values of respect and tolerance, including tolerance for diversity. What Obama has done is to create a coalition of those who want to give America a facelift in their uh, discordant images. What I want to do is to lead the nation to invite these large demographic groups into full citizenship. Now, I'm not talking about amnesty here with respect to the uh, unlawful immigrants. I'm talking about people participating more fully in the citizenship of democracy. And we need to also respect our core values of respect, tolerance, opportunity, and hope for real change by putting these values to work in our 50 states while cutting back the federal elitist bureaucracy an amazing amount of federal spending. Let 50 flowers bloom. Let them bloom in the desert. 
along the west coast of California, drought-stricken areas, in the heartland, in the snowdrifts, in our American South, and all along the Mexican-United States border. Our federal government should provide genuine American leadership and restore America's position as an example, not as a sugar daddy. Part of Obama's failure in the Middle East, besides his abandonment of Israel and actually attempting to take over the Israeli government in the last election, has been to leave too many suffering on the ground while bringing subversive people to the United States that are not only trying to fight in their own homelands, and many Americans, including American Jews, are legitimately concerned about the lands of their forefathers and their people. Barack Obama, Hillary and Bill Clinton, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, we're all concerned. But when we attempt to impose our values by force or threat of force in aid of foreign enemies, then we've got to stop this. This is subversive. Now, I talked about Africa. Obama's African policy is an insult to Africans. He forced homosexuality on them, too. So will Clinton, no doubt. Plus, they want to get gender quotas in all the governments of the Middle East, and I'm sure in Africa as well. This is imposing our values, well, the values of some of us. Not having a foreign policy. Yes, we should export our ideas of freedom. But I don't think that Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton have the slightest idea of freedom as defined and secured by the United States Constitution. Their idea of justice is just as cynical as their idea of democracy, which is big spending and manipulation of the media and of election laws and big media events. They are real politic practitioners, Machiavellians who pretend to have the values they think will win, not those which are of lasting and real importance. So my solution is to back away from massive capital shift to war by technology. We need a real peace offensive, not only throughout the world and in critical areas like Europe, Russia, and the Middle East and Africa, and even East Asia, but we need a real peace offensive in this nation. If we just keep maximizing short-term profits for the economic elite, while making our workforce and even human beings like the little victims of abortion superfluous, then we will not have peace. More police and security will never substitute for real human rights and opportunity. And we must put our best minds to work on this in a private and public partnership that extends nationally and internationally. If this is the kind of thing Bill and Hillary Clinton think they're doing, then we need to do better. This must not exist in the shadows of international networks of foundations but in the fabric of each and every state. We have got to the point where not only are people superfluous, but our very states, the nation is composed of, are superfluous. And this needs to be radically reversed. And my foreign policy and national security is to humanize our international relations as we humanize our nation and its constitution as intended by our founders, whom I believe were inspired by God to survive and found this land. This is the highest value in our nation today. I'm Steve Carlson. I'm an independent candidate running for president of the United States, and I approve this message. Thank you for watching.